Good morning, I'm George Wenzel. I'm a former professor here at McGill University, uh, now Professor Emeritus, I understand, which has no cachet because everybody becomes Professor Emeritus now. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm here in the Department of Geography, um, although I'm basically an anthropologist by training. My first degrees were in anthropology. But to begin with the sequence, if I may, I grew up just outside New York City, about 20 miles out of New York in northern New Jersey, uh, in a small town that's still small by their standards. Uh, it actually has the oldest median uh, popula uh, aged population in New Jersey. <laughs> uh, and uh, my parents' families came there to work in the mills when there were still mills, uh, and they stayed on, and in fact, until I left home, no one in the family had moved more than about 10 miles from where they grew up. So uh, in any case, um, it was, you know, um, I went to uh, parochial schools. Uh, I did my elementary school or grammar school in this small town, Garfield, New Jersey, um, where mainly, uh, you know, I played sports and kids, kids thing. Then went on, uh, uh, to high school in Jersey City, um, again, a parochial school, all boys school, and uh, <clears throat> where, uh, again, I played a lot of sports. I would never have said I was a very good student, <laughs> to be absolutely honest, which I proved as an undergraduate later on in college, where I played a lot of sports and not a lot of other things. But my parents, my father worked for Consolidated Edison in New York. He was a middle-level manager. My mother was a housewife. It was, you know, the 50s and 60s. I was born in 1947. Uh, my father had come back from the Second World War and I guess, 45, late 45. And I was an only child. Uh, I would have had an older sister. She died at birth, and so I was together. My father was a very strict person. It was a very Catholic family. The whole extended family on both sides was quite Catholic. Uh, one side was Sudeten German, the other side was uh, um, Czech, Bohemian. Uh, and uh, I lived in a neighborhood that was basically all uh, housing for veterans who had come back from the Second World War. So. Uh, it all, we, so there was a cohort of children all around my age, basically, and born in 47. And I lived there uh, pretty well until I went away to college, although I commuted to high school and, in fact, lived part-time in Jersey City during uh, certain sporting sports seasons. I mainly played football, but baseball, basketball, and things like that. Um, it, I remember... Uh, uh, the nuns with great fondness from elementary school. Uh, I was, but I, I really enjoyed going actually to Jesuit high school. Uh, I think that in terms of thinking about things, it was the relationship with the Jesuits. Not that I, I consider myself a secular Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that I uh, attend religious services, but uh, I, I still, a lot of things that came from the Jesuits uh, are still in me. So my education was pretty much, except for the religious training, like you would have any place else, I'm, I'm, as, as far as I know. And so, uh, and I'm, you know, I consider a pretty normal upbringing, the 1950s, early 1960s. We're not particularly involved in things like political issues, except civil rights caught my issue, uh, caught my interest as I was growing up. And so uh, when it came to colleges, I actually, I, it was very peculiar. I went to, the high school I went to called St. Peter's Prep, uh, 
in Jersey City, uh, certainly encourage students to go on to Catholic colleges. And so I applied to a whole bunch of colleges, and then I slipped in one non-Catholic college, which is the one I wanted to go to. <laughs> and in fact, that was the first acceptance that I received. And so I told my father that it was, he knew nothing about the school. Neither of my parents, my father had never gone to university. He had started working in the Depression before he went in. He went into the service at the age of 32. Uh, my mother never finished high school. Uh, n neither were we readers, but they were interesting people. And uh, I was very, very close to my mother. My father was very strict, and we had issues. He was sort of a polymath, and he could never understand why I could not understand calculus. And his way of teaching was to say it louder. It was sort of like going to, through immigration <laughs> or customs, <laughs> especially into the United States where they just yell at you louder if you don't understand. So um, uh, I went off to Beloit College in Wisconsin. And uh, uh, I left high school actually under a bit of a cloud because I had gotten into an altercation with a one of my teachers. It was still a time where you could do corporal punishment. And I felt I had been unjustly slapped around and I slapped back. And so I was kind of tossed out just before graduation. Not tossed out, it's suspended. So I went home and told my mother and she told me I should hit the road before my father got home. So I hitchhiked across the United States with whatever money she had in a coffee can. And so I spent about three months traveling around, uh, working odd jobs, and eventually found my way to Beloit College in Wisconsin, which where, where I had been accepted. And uh, specifically, I went there, to be absolutely honest, not because of the academics. I wanted to play football. And I knew I wasn't going to play at a big time college. So I went to Beloit. And for the first time in my life, encountered almost everyone who was different from me and from where I grew up. Nobody, everyone were the children of vice presidents of General Motors. It was a real Midwestern school that was just opening up people from the coasts. So I was one of probably a hundred students who came in in that cohort who were not from Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois. And it was really strange to me. Uh, I had never heard anybody be sarcastic. I remember I would get into fights when I first got to college, when I realized people were kind of... So I was often, I actually was put on probation twice for assaulting <laughs> classmates. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I, I also realized that it was, a, as I began classes, originally in classics, but it was a liberal arts college. So I took everything from geology to political science, linguistics, but mainly classics. But along the way, I also took a lot of anthropology classes. And it was really interesting, but I didn't think too much about it. Uh, in the end, I actually wound up majoring in anthropology because as I got towards my last uh, year at the college, I realized I had so many credits in anthropology. And uh, it went from classroom work. Beloit College uh, was, had an interesting, anthropology was probably the largest major there. They had five or six faculty. Uh, and they ran field schools all over the world, Taiwan, Turkey, Mexico, Peru. I just happened to uh, drift to an archeologist and started uh, working with his field crews mostly because it got me off campus and out of trouble. So I would, uh, I did a lot of the logistics, canoeing and things like that around northern Wisconsin uh, and so on and found I really enjoyed it. I really liked archeology span and, and uh, part of it was just being outside and just really interested in something I knew very little about when I came there. I mean, I, as you can, might admit, I didn't have a very wide intellectual universe when I came to college. That really developed there.
Critical thinking, I think, came from the Jesuits, uh, but uh, uh, which is probably why I got into so much trouble when I was first got there. Uh, I remember they asked me to go see a psychiatrist, and I said I would only see him if he came to my room, <laughs> which he didn't. And I don't know why, but uh, in any case, it worked out fine. And I, uh, I went through college in three and a half years, uh, mostly because everyone was talking. It was the era of, era of Vietnam, and everyone was talking about how they were going to get out of the draft and so on. And I just got tired of it, and I just decided to cram all the rest of my courses into one term and leave. And uh, which I did, and I went to actually uh, when I finished in the fall of six, uh, the end of the fall of 1968, I went to work in an outdoor education school in New Hampshire, and uh, did that for uh, through the winter. It's actually where I met my wife, although we didn't marry for many years later. Uh, well, about four four years later, but. That can be a story for another thing. There are two, two boxes up there of letters we exchanged when I was in the Arctic that I'm going to give to my daughter one of these days. <laughs> in any case, uh, so I, decided, I kind of fell into anthropology, to be honest. I still had classics credits and so on, but I wasn't interested in what I came to call goody-grabbing sort of classical archaeology. I was interested in working with North American peoples. And in my junior year at Beloit, they had a sessional lecturer come down from the University of Wisconsin. And then you may know this, Frederick. Uh, Wisconsin at that time was the center for Arctic research. Uh, Chester Chard was there, Bill Laughlin, and the it was just full of graduate students working in from, from Alaska into the Canadian Arctic and so on. And the fellow who came down I consider uh, one of the most important people in my lives because he brought me north was a guy named Bill Workman. He just passed away about six months ago, seven months ago. Uh, he was an archaeologist uh, from, he grew up in Wisconsin and uh, taught a northern course, which was my first exposure to northern. And if you can imagine, well, you probably know outside of the Fifth Thule expedition, and Janessa's work, there was virtually nothing. There was just starting to be books coming out like Gene Briggs, Dick Nelson, and so on. So our textbook was Boaz's, The Central Eskimo. I mean, talk about turgid. <laughs> but I did a project for him. I wrote a, we had to do an undergraduate thesis. Uh, and I, I, I had already done several years or summers of archaeological research in northern Wisconsin. And I went to him and said, you know, would you? he was going back to the Yukon to finish his PhD research. And I asked him if he would take me. He said, no, he had his crew. And so I finished and uh, uh, actually got hired to by the Kentucky Archaeological Survey. And so I was down in Kentucky in the hottest place I've ever been in my life. Uh, 100 degrees every day and 100% humidity. It was god awful. <laughs> and got a phone call from him, and he said one of his crew members had come down with appendicitis and couldn't go. And did I still want to go to the Yukon? So I quit my job and drove up to Madison, and uh, it was my first trip to Canada, actually. Uh, flew from Chicago. To Vancouver, uh, where I was stopped by Customs and Im Immigration with a bunch of camping gear and a couple of guns <laughs> and stuff. And uh, they had, in those days, you had to fly to Whitehorse from Vancouver. It was an old prop plane, a DC 6. And I was supposed to be flying out the next day. Well, they held me at immigration and I missed my flight. And they gave me the landed immigrants test. And I said, I don't want to immigrate. I didn't know what it was. And uh, uh, so uh, and because they said you failed, I said, but I didn't want to immigrate. And I had a letter from the National Museum of Canada. Bill was being funded by the National Museum. 
which, by the way, was pretty well staffed by people from the University of Wisconsin at that time. We used to call it the National Museum of Wisconsin. And so I said, I have this letter here. And they said, well, it's late at night type of thing, you know. And I said, well, one way or the other, if you don't call him, I will. I'll call the head of the museum at home, and he'll explain what I'm doing. So uh, eventually I got on the plane up to Whitehorse. And uh, one of my first, because I was one of the first to arrive, I was the first to arrive, was to set up some logistics and so on, which is mainly riding a truck, renting a truck, excuse me. And saw my first grizzly bear two miles out of Whitehorse at that time. And it was just a gravel road that ran to the Alaskan border. And we were going up to uh, the old village of Asiak, an old Tuchoni village, which was going to be our base camp. We had to canoe it. And uh, there were myself, Bill Workman, and his wife, a fellow named Jeff Mauger from the uh, University of Alaska, and uh, a Japanese graduate student uh, from uh, Kenesaku Hayashi, from, who wound up at teaching at Sapporo. In, back in Japan, and it was after he left Wisconsin, was trained by Hans Müllerbeck in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And my interest then was in uh, basically Paleolithic, North American Paleolithic, Arctic small tool tradition type stuff, Northwest microblade, and so on. And so I tooled around the, uh, the, the Yukon for uh, a summer, uh, doing archaeology doing walking surveys on my own, uh, you know, 20, 30 miles, avoiding bears <laughs> as much as I could, learning how to shoot a rifle. Growing up in New York, never had to worry about firearms. So uh, in any case, uh, um, uh, got to go over to Alaska for a bit and so on, got to ride on the White Horse, uh, the Yukon and White, White Pass Railway. Uh, had finished up my undergraduate and uh, uh, didn't really know what I was going to do. I basically, I thought I was looking at a career as, as a dig bum. I hadn't really thought about a PhD. I applied to a few schools, but I didn't give it much thought. I was an abysmal undergraduate student. I was barely a C student. I spent all my time getting my head bashed in playing football. I had concussion after concussion. And, in those days, you didn't think about it, you just played. And so, uh, but I always enjoyed the anthro classes. I always did well in anthropology, relatively well in classics, and pretty poorly in most other things. Not failing, but just hanging in there, you know. Part of it because in terms of the social life, I resented the place so much. So uh, I, uh, I remember one of uh, the administrators in my first year suggesting that I transfer out, and I. That made me decide to stay. I was not going to let them run me out, <laughs> despite everything. So, and I had at, at, at two of the anthropologists at Beloit. One was an archaeologist named uh, uh, Bob Salzer, and the other was a man named uh, 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 Marco Bicchieri, who grew up in Africa. Uh, his father had been, I think, uh, an administrator in Ethiopia during the war. And he had spent all his life, until he was in his 40s, he went to graduate school to do a PhD at the University of Minnesota. And in fact, he almost forced me to apply for a PhD. I, I did it just mainly to please him. He thought I had a future. And so, uh, but go, as I said, I jump around a lot. Going back to the Wisconsin co connection, Bill Workman, talked me up around the lab there. And out of the blue, I got a call from Alan McCartney, who was a graduate student there, and who had had a pretty rough ride while he was there. Well, he was still finishing up his PhD, as, as a matter of fact. And he asked me if I wanted to join his field crew to go to Northwest Hudson Bay, a project he was doing with uh, Charles Murbs, who had been at the University of Chicago and then went down to uh, Arizona. He was a physical anthropologist. So part of the work I did that s next couple of summers was excavating burials. And we didn't think about any rules around burials. We excavated burials. These were Thule Age burials. So I went with McCartney. I spent the summer on Northwest Hudson Bay. It was my first encounter with Inuit. Uh, 
very sporadic. But he was finishing up, and I decided for my master's, well, I'll get to my master's degree, that I wanted to continue the project. So uh, when I came out of the field that summer from uh, uh, working up north of Chesterfield Inlet, I found that I had been accepted at the University of Manitoba, which I had applied to, and actually at a couple of other places. Like, and the other places were in the States, Wyoming. I can't remember some of the other places. And uh, I thought, well, if I'm going to work in Northwest Hudson Bay, Winnipeg's the railhead, the <coughs> Churchill. So I'm just going to go here. And the, it, it was very fortuitous that I went there because um, they had a number of Arctic people, including Tiger Birch. But several other people, John Mathiason, who had worked at <coughs> Pond Inlet, and uh, a couple of other people who had dabbled, either with Dene in northern Manitoba, Skip Coolidge. But it was Tiger. The interesting thing was I never took any courses from Tiger. I took courses from uh, Joanne De Pena, Joanne Townsend, people who had worked with the International Biological Program, in Glulik, as it turned out. Uh, and and when I got there, I, I realized what a good education I had received at Beloit in anthropology. And so I, uh, I, in fact, I put myself on what I call, you had to do comprehensives for your masters, uh, on a great books course. And I started to read everything I could in anthropology, going back to Tyler and Fraser right up to more contemporary stuff. Uh, Jean Briggs, and I'll get to that. One of the best things I ever did was read Jean Briggs. Not so much, f I had never met, I met Jean many years later. But uh, um, anyway, I, I, I did my thesis at, uh, and research at Manitoba in archeology, span really, working back up in Northwest Hudson Bay. And when I went to the field there, I took an old friend of mine from the States, but I also had two Inuit go out with me. I didn't take a large field crew, basically for company. So they got to hunt, basically, but they kept, they moved us around and so on. And I did a lot of, mainly, I, began, I decided to work strictly on Dorset archaeology. I found some Dorset sites, and it was great. And so I wrote up my thesis. And they were holding the CASCA meetings, or what became CASCA, in Winnipeg that year. Uh, my la I would have been, I guess, 1970. I'm not positive of the year. And I had volunteered to drive people in from the airport. And one of the guys who got in my car was David Domas, who became one of the two most important intellectual influences in my life, to be honest, he and Tiger Birch. Uh, and, and so, uh, if you ever met Dave Domas, I don't know if you've ever met Dave. Well, I'll tell you stories about Dave as yeah. we go. <laughs> and students are constantly amused by David's stories. He was an ex-Marine. Uh, and you've met Tiger, I'm sure. Okay. They w had been classmates in Chicago, as it turned out. Anyway, as I was winding down, I also made a, a promise to myself that I would finish Manitoba, I would be the first graduate student to finish the program in two, the, the uh, required two years. I, was, I hated Winnipeg. It was the coldest place I've, to this day, I swear, I've ever been in my life. Doesn't matter where I've been in the Arctic, Winnipeg was the coldest place. Those winters were brutal. And uh, John Mathiason caught up to me just a couple of, couple of, uh, weeks before I was finishing, and he said he had gotten a call from Dave Domas, and David had a grant from Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. Apparently, they had a benefactor who gave them money to update their Arctic room or whatever, and he had been searching around for someone who would do this project, which was collect modern artifacts, and Matthiason asked me if I would do it. I said, sure, and I went off to do another field stint up in Northwest Hudson Bay and had spoken with Thomas. I didn't know him well at the time. And he said, well, I want you to go to Tom Bay on Boothia Peninsula. Interesting. 
time. I didn't know much, anything about it. I mean, I literally, my contact with living in Inuit was the two guys that were with me, a young guy and an elder. And uh, we did a lot of caribou hunting that summer as well as archaeology, I have to admit. And we moved around by boat and so on. But in any case, uh, when I came out of the field, I got into Chesterfield and the weather was really bad. I was supposed to, the only way to get to Tom Bay was to charter out of Churchill. But uh, the weather couldn't fly. So I was staying at the RC Mission, which you've written about. So I knew Father Mias and various of the priests and so on. And the number of the Inuit. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in your, the book you did on the mission, uh, you mentioned Louis Otto. Mm. And it was Louis' son who was with me. He was about 14 years old, who many years later told me it was the best summer he ever had. <laughs> in any case, while I was there, Father Henri had come down from Pelly Bay. And so we would see each other. And Father Henri didn't, spoke very little English. He spoke in and French. I didn't speak French, but about the third day over coffee in the mission, uh, one of the brothers was there. I can't remember the brother's name, but he translated between us and Father Henri was asking me where I was going. I said, Tom Bay, and he said, well, the government pulled everybody out of there. There's nobody at Tom Bay. So I said, oh, well, I canceled the charter, came back south, and went immediately to Hamilton, Ontario, because that's where Domus was. I said, Dave, you know, this project is dead in the water. And he said, well, I heard about places where there are still people living in camps up on Baffin Island. Go to Baffin Island. So I got on, I got on uh, the Nord Air flight, which was based out of Hamilton at that time. And his last words, he gave me two words of advice. He said, take a a case of cognac and don't start field work until you finish it. And remember you're there to study the kinship, not to expand it. And I didn't take his first advice. I didn't take any cognac, but I never have expanded kinship either, <laughs> at least in the North. So um, that's how I launched my career into, and the agreement was McMaster did not have a PhD program, but they were due to get one that if I spent a year in the field, I would come back to McMaster as Domus's student. And so uh, he was to be my supervisor 